Welcome to the Just Dumb Enough Podcast. I am your host, as always, Colton Petrie. And, well, everyone, we made it all the way here to episode 100. I'm not sure how many of you have been with me this whole time, and how many of you are just showing up for the first time. Life has a way of changing around us. And very little, in my life at least, is the same as when I started this podcast in September of 2021. I had no social media audience, and I guess in many ways that's still the same when I look at Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, but that also meant that the only people I could convince to listen were the people in my everyday life. People who lived in the same fraction of a country, really, and there weren't that many of them. The first month especially, I was excited when a non-release day had a single download. Someone I didn't know, willing to spend part of their day listening to the thing I created. Even now, thinking about interacting with someone's life like that, it makes me happy enough to start crying. But now, I can't even remember a recent day where I didn't have downloads at least in the double digits. And not to mention you all in the audience. Realize it or not, you are part of a global community that listens to this show. Thousands of people from two-thirds of the countries on this planet have played the same episodes and listened to the same voices. I think that's something special. I've always tried to keep my personal experience and most of my life events pretty removed from the show, mostly just so that I can be a good surrogate for the listeners. Firstly, because I don't think my life is all that interesting outside of these interviews. That and I can't imagine people are actually curious to know if I'm happily married or in the middle of a divorce. It also makes these interviews feel strange if I were to acknowledge at the top of an episode that I also worked in the same field as my expert, but proceeded to ask entry-level questions. That said, I don't usually have that issue because I'm not an expert in much of anything, and especially not when compared to the people I bring on, who are usually stars in their fields. Now, the parts of this show and my life that I have shared have been being able to travel and seeing other parts of the country. That's also something I never saw coming, sitting in the same professional studio as podcasts with millions of viewers. That and meeting people in all of these places who liked the show enough to want to meet up and hang out with me. It's led to some awesome memories that I won't ever forget. Anyway, all of that to say, thank you for listening. It's been a crazy experience, and if I have any say in the matter, I'll be doing it for many, many more years to come. It's a new year for me and the show, so I hope to bring you even more great guests, and to meet even more of you out there on the road in 2023. Along with that, I'm hoping to finally branch out and start publishing even more types of content. While I'm not allowed to talk about it at length or in detail, I'm working as a writer and voice actor on an international team for an audio drama that will hopefully come out soonish. So hopefully you'll all enjoy that too. On the same measure, writing like that has gotten the creative thoughts flooding out of me, so I'm planning to start developing my own audio drama with a weird twist. I still have things I want to get through and a lot to learn about the new types of skills it requires, but there will be a rough clip towards the end of this episode if you want to get an idea of what it'll be like, so keep listening. It's also been brought to my attention, repeatedly, that my voice is so relaxing in these extended episodes where I'm the only speaker that it can put people to sleep. While I work very hard on the educational content for Just Dumb Enough, I'm not opposed to giving people another show where they can just turn on a playlist of me reading and drift off at night. Feel free to do that with this episode, by the way. I'll also be attaching a rough clip of that and what it might sound like to the end of this episode for those who are interested, so keep listening for that too. And I think finally... I'm going to be teaming up with someone to make YouTube content revolving around tabletop role-playing games, 
We're going to start with Monster of the Week by Michael Sands. It's a game that takes players and drops them into worlds just like that of Supernatural, The X-Files, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and so many others. So if that's something that even remotely interests you, reach out and I'll let you know when it goes live. That just about wraps up all my plans for the time being. Um, I am also co-authoring a novel with a guest who was on the show, but it's going to be a while before we start sharing anything major about that as we are both very busy. I'm not planning on dragging this episode out to the length of most of our interview episodes, so let's just jump into the only listener question that I got. Remember, if you want to reach out, the email is dumbenoughpodcast at gmail.com, or you can get a hold of me on any of the show's social media pages. Don't be afraid, I am very nice to everyone who writes in, and I honestly get so little fan interaction that sometimes I am a little worried about it. Anyway... Morgan asks, why the catchphrases? Great question, Morgan. I'm assuming you mean let's and appreciate it immensely, which are the two things I say pretty often. First, it's because I want us to go through things together with this show, and the other is to let guests know that their valuable time has not been wasted on someone who doesn't care. That said, I don't always say immensely or whatever other adjective. And usually that's because the person before or during the interview is kind of a jerk or is clearly using the show strictly for marketing, and I don't appreciate that. Secondly, it's kind of an identity phrase. It has meaning to me, as I mentioned, and I'd like that to represent the Just Dumb Enough podcast brand for people listening. Thank you again for that question, Morgan. Before we slide into those audio clips for the new projects... Please remember to leave a five-star review and ratings for the show on iTunes, Spotify, or Audible. It's the only thing that helps the show rise up in the rankings, and that helps new people find the podcast. Also, telling people to listen to the show is a huge, huge help. Word of mouth is an incredibly powerful advertisement for new listeners to check the episodes out. If it helps, you can also tell them I'm a number one featured uh, education podcast on Podbean. That's some bragging rights. It helps you sound even more valid when you're recommending the show. Anyway, without further delay, here's a brief, rough draft for the audio drama. Keeping in mind, I'll be drafting actual voice actors for other parts in the future, so it won't be just me. And also, I'll be much better at audioscaping by then with some practice. Clinical Notes for New Patient, Abigail Winters Abigail presents with exceedingly vivid dreams in which she claims she is tormented relentlessly and frequently targeted by murderers from whom she is unable to escape. This led her to attempt suicide, and as such be involuntarily remanded to our care here at the Springtime Psychiatric Hospital. My initial thoughts recognize potential causes could range from narcolepsy or insomnia up to schizophrenia. The cause should become clear after the scheduled evaluation. Right on time. Please, come in. Abigail, thank you for seeing me today. I understand you haven't been sleeping well during your first few days here. I try not to sleep at all. Hmm. Why is that? You don't know what it's like. Everyone else has their dreams from night to night and enjoy some fun version of escape into fantasy, but not me. I have to tell myself the dreams aren't real. To stay out of bed despite how damn tired I am. Setting constant alarms and medicating until I'm so numb that I'm barely human. Not being able to even trust that I'm awake. And do you think you're awake right now, Abigail? If I'm not, then you're about to kill me. I really love setting up all this story and how much potential it has. 
Obviously, I've got a lot to learn, and I need a cast to make this really pop, but just this first step sharing it is a huge milestone. Please let me know if it's something that you like or are even interested in. I could use any encouragement I could get with going outside my comfort zone in this. And then just lastly, I'm going to be reading from the first chapter of The Adventure of Sherlock Holmes by Arthur Conan Doyle. Primarily, I picked this because it's past its copyright time and I won't get sued for reading it. But it's also a very popular story over the last century even, and moving forward I'd be willing to read lots of other stories altogether. Ultimately, I'm not sure how much people care what I'm reading if they're just using it to sleep anyway, but feel free to let me know what you would like to hear when I do get this up and running. Chapter 1. A Scandal in Bohemia To Sherlock Holmes, she is always the woman. I have seldom heard him mention her under any other name. In his eyes, she eclipses and predominates the whole of her sex. It is not that he felt any emotion akin to love for Irene Adler. All emotions, and that one particularly, were abhorrent to his cold, precise, but admirably balanced mind. He was, I take it, the most perfect reasoning and observing machine that the world has seen. But as a lover, he would have placed himself in a false position. He never spoke of the softer passions, save with a jibe and a sneer. They were admirable things for the observer, excellent for drawing the veil from men's motives and actions, but for the trained reasoner to admit such intrusions into his own delicate and finely adjusted temperament was to introduce a distracting factor which might throw a doubt upon his mental results. Grit in a sensitive instrument, or a crack in one of his own high-powered lenses, would not be more disturbing than a strong emotion in a nature such as his. And yet, there was but one woman to him, and that woman was the late Irene Adler, of dubious and questionable memory. I had seen little of Holmes lately. My marriage had drifted us away from each other. My own complete happiness and home-centered interests which rise up around the man who first finds himself master of his own establishment were sufficient to absorb all my attention. While Holmes who loathed every form of society with his whole bohemian soul, remained in our lodgings in Baker Street, buried among his old books and alternating from week to week between cocaine and ambition. The drowsiness of the drug and the fierce energy of his own keen nature. He was still, as ever, deeply attracted by the study of crime and occupied by his immense faculties and extraordinary powers of observation in following out those clues and clearing up those mysteries which had been abandoned as hopeless by the official police. From time to time, I heard some vague accounts of his doings, of his summons to Odessa in the case of the Trepoff murder, of his clearing up of the singular tragedy of the Atkins brothers at Tracomaly and finally of the mission which he had accomplished so delicately and successfully for the reigning family of Holland. Beyond these signs of activity, however, which I merely shared with all the readers of the daily press, I knew little of my former friend and companion. One night, it was on the 20th of March, 1888, I was returning from a journey to a patient, for I had now returned to civil practice, when my way led me through Baker Street. As I passed the well-remembered door, which must always be associated in my mind with my wooing and with the dark incidents of the study in Scarlet, I was seized with a keen desire to see Holmes again, and to know how he was employing his extraordinary powers. His rooms were brilliantly lit, and, even as I looked up, I saw his tall, spare figure pass twice in the dark silhouette against the blind. He was pacing the room swiftly, eagerly, 
with his head sunk upon his chest and his hands clasped behind him. To me, who knew his every mood and habit, his attitude and manner told their own story. He was at work again. He had risen out of his drug-created dreams and was hot upon the scent of some new problem. I rang the bell and was shown up to the chamber which had formerly been in part my own. His manner was not effusive. It seldom was. But he was glad, I think, to see me. With hardly a word spoken, but with a kindly eye, he waved me to an armchair, threw across his case of cigars, and indicated a spirit case and a gasogene in the corner. Then he stood before the fire and looked me over in his singular introspective fashion. Wedlock suits you, he remarked. I think, Watson, that you have put on seven and a half pounds since I saw you. Seven, I answered. Indeed, I should have thought a little more. Just a trifle more, I fancy, Watson. And in practice again, I observe, you did not tell me that you intended to go into harness. Then how did you know? I see it. I deduce it. How do I know that you have been getting yourself very wet lately, and that you have a most clumsy and careless servant girl? My dear Holmes, said I, this is too much. You would certainly have been burdened, had you lived a few centuries ago. It is true that I had a country walk on Thursday and came home in a dreadful mess. But as I have changed my clothes, I can't imagine how you deduce it. As to Mary Jane, she is incorrigible, and my wife has given her notice. But there, again, I fail to see how you work it out. He chuckled to himself and rubbed his long, nervous hands together. It is simplicity itself, said he. My eyes tell me that on the inside of your left shoe, just where the firelight strikes it, the leather is scored by six almost parallel cuts. Obviously, they could have been caused by someone who was carelessly scraped around the edges of the sole in order to remove crusted mud from them. Hence, you see my double deduction that you had been out in vile weather, and that you had a particularly malignant boot-splitting specimen of the London slavery. As to your practice, if a gentleman walks into my room smelling of adiaform with a black mark of nitrate of silver upon his right forefinger, and a bulge on the right side of his top hat to show where he has secreted his stethoscope, I must be dull indeed if I do not pronounce him to be an active member of the medical profession. I could not help laugh at the ease with which he explained his process of deduction. When I hear you give your reasons, I remark, the thing always appears to me to be so ridiculously simple that I could easily do it myself. Though at each successive instance of your reasoning I am baffled until you explain your process. And yet, I believe that my eyes are as good as yours. Quite so he answered, lighting a cigarette and throwing himself down into an armchair. You see, but you do not observe. The distinction is clear. For example, you have frequently seen the steps which lead up from the hall to this room. Frequently? How often? Well, some hundreds of times. Then how many are there? How many? I don't know. Quite so. You have not observed, and yet you have seen. That is just my point. Now, I know that there are seventeen steps because I have both seen and observed. By the way, since you are interested in these little problems, and since you are good enough to chronicle one or two of my trifling experiences, you may be interested in this. He threw over a sheet of thick, pink-tinted notepaper which had been lying open upon the table. It came by the last post, said he. Read it aloud. The note was undated, and without either signature or address. There will call upon you tonight, at a quarter to eight o'clock, it said, a gentleman who desires to consult you upon a matter of the very deepest moment. 
your recent services to one of the royal houses of Europe have shown that you are one who may safely be trusted with matters which are of an importance which can hardly be exaggerated. This account of you have from all quarters received. Be in your chamber, then, at that hour, and do not take it amiss if your visitor wears a mask. This is indeed a mystery, I remarked. What do you imagine that it means? I have no data yet. It is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. But from the note itself, what do you deduce from it? I carefully examine the writing and the paper upon which it was written. The man who wrote it was presumably well-to-do, I remarked, endeavoring to imitate my companion's process. Such paper could not be bought under half a crown a packet. It is peculiarly strong and stiff. Peculiar, that is the very word, said Holmes. It is not an English paper at all. Hold it up to the light. I did so, and saw a large E, with a small G, a P, and a large G, with a small T, woven into the texture of the paper. What do you make of that? asked Holmes. The name of the maker, no doubt, or his monogram, rather. Not at all. The G with the small T stands for Gesellschaft, which is the German for company. It is a customary contraction, like our Co. P, of course, stands for Papier. Now for the E.G. Let us glance at our Continental Gazetteer. He took down a heavy brown volume from his shelves. Eglo, Eglonitz. Here we are, Egria. It is in a German-speaking country, in Bohemia, not far from Carlsbad, remarkable as being the scene of the death of Wallenstein, and for its numerous glass factories and paper mills. <laughs> My boy, what do you make of that? His eyes sparkled, and he sent up a great blue triumphant cloud from his cigarette. The paper was made in Bohemia, I said. Precisely. And the man who wrote the note is a German. Do you note the peculiar construction of the sentence? This account of you we have from all quarters received. A Frenchman or Russian could not have written that. It is the German who is so uncourteous to his verbs. It only remains, therefore, to discover what is wanted by this German who writes upon bohemian paper and prefers wearing a mask to showing his face. And here he comes, if I am not mistaken, to resolve our doubts. As he spoke, there was a sharp sound of horses' hooves and grating wheels against the curb, followed by a sharp pull at the bell. Holmes whistled. A pair by the sound, said he. Yes, he continued, glancing out the window. A nice little brockham and a pair of beauties. A hundred and fifty guineas apiece. There's money in this case, Watson, if there is nothing else. I think that I had better go, Holmes. Not a bit, doctor. Stay where you are. I am lost without my Boswell, and this promises to be interesting. It would be a pity to miss it. But your client. Never mind him. I may want your help, and so may he. Here he comes. Sit down in the armchair, doctor, and give us your best attention. A slow and heavy step which had been heard upon the stairs and in the passage paused immediately outside the door. Then there was a loud and authoritative tap. Come in, said Holmes. A man entered who could hardly have been less than six feet six inches in height with the chest and limbs of a Hercules. His dress was rich with a richness which would, in England, be looked upon as akin to bad taste. Heavy bands of Ascartan were slashed across the sleeves in front of his double-breasted coat. 
while the deep blue cloak which was thrown over his shoulders was lined with flame-colored silk and secured at the neck with a brooch which consisted of a single flaming barrel. Boots which extended halfway up his calves and which were trimmed at the top with rich brown fur completed the impression of barbaric opulence which was suggested by his whole appearance. He carried a broad-brimmed hat in his hand, while he wore across the upper part of his face, extending down past the cheekbones, a black vizard mask, which he had apparently adjusted that very moment, for his hand was still raised to it as he entered. From the lower part of the face he appeared to be a man of strong character, with a thick, hanging lip and a long, straight chin, suggestive of resolution pushed to the length of obstinacy. I told you this I would call. He looked from one to the other of us, as if uncertain which to address. Pray take a seat, said Holmes. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson, who is occasionally good enough to help me in my cases. Whom have I the honor to address? You may know me as the Count von Kram, a bohemian nobleman. I understand that this gentleman is your friend, is a man of honor and discretion, whom I may trust with a matter of the most extreme importance. If not, I should much prefer to communicate with you alone. I rose to go, but Holmes caught me by the wrist and pushed me back to my chair. It is both or none said he. You may say before this gentleman anything which you may say to me. The Count shrugged his broad shoulders. Then I must begin, said he, by binding you both to absolute secrecy for two years. At the end of that time, the matter will be of no importance. At present, it will not be too much to say that it is of such weight that it may have an influence upon European history. I promise, said Holmes, and I. You will excuse this mask, continued our strange visitor. The august person who employs me wishes his agent to be unknown to you, and I may confess that on once that the title by which I have just called myself is not exactly who I am. I was aware of it, said Holmes dryly. The circumstances are of great delicacy, and every precaution has to be taken to quench what might grow from the imminent scandal and serious compromise one of the reigning families of Europe. To speak plainly, the matter indicates the great house of Ormstein, hereditary kings of Bohemia. I was aware of that, murmured Holmes, settling himself down in his armchair and closing his eyes. Our visitor glanced with some apparent surprise at the languid, lounging figure of the man who had no doubt depicted to him at the most incise reasoner and most energetic agent in Europe. Holmes slowly reopened his eyes and looked impatiently at his gigantic client. If your majesty would condescend to state your case, he remarked, I should be better able to advise you. The man sprang from his chair and paced up and down the room in uncontrollable agitation. Then, with a gesture of desperation, he tore the mask from his face and hurled it upon the ground. You are right, he cried. I am the king. Why should I attempt to conceal it? Why, indeed, murmured Holmes. Your Majesty had not spoken before I was aware that I was addressing Wilhelm Gostrich, Sigismund von Ermstein, Grand Duke of Kassel Felstein, and Hereditary King of Bohemia. But you can understand, said our strange visitor, sitting down once more and passing his hand over his high white forehead. You can understand that I am not accustomed to doing such business in my own person. Yet the matter was so delicate that I could not confide it to an agent without putting myself in his power. I have become incognito from Prague for the purpose of consulting you. Then pray consult, said Holmes, shutting his eyes once more. The facts are briefly these. Some five years ago, 
During a lengthy visit to Warsaw, I made the acquaintance of a well-known adventuress, Irene Adler. The name is no doubt familiar to you. Kindly look her up in my index, doctor, murmured Holmes without opening his eyes. For many years he had adopted a system of docketing all paragraphs concerning men and things, so it was difficult to name a subject or a person on which he could not at once furnish information. In this case I found her biography sandwiched in between that of a Hebrew rabbi and that of a staff commander who had written a monograph upon the deep-sea fishes. Let me see, said Holmes. Prima Donna, Imperial Opera of Warsaw, yes. Retired from the operatic stage. <laughs> Living in London, quite so. Your Majesty, as I understand, became entangled with this young person, wrote her some compromising letters, and is now desirous of getting those letters back. Precisely so, but how? Was there a secret marriage? None. No legal papers or certificates? None. Then I fail to follow, your majesty. If this young person should produce her letters for blackmailing or other purposes, how is she to prove their authenticity? There is the writing. Oh, forgery. My private notepaper. Stolen. My own seal. Imitated. My photograph. Bought. We were both in the photographs. Oh, dear. That is very bad. Your Majesty has indeed committed an indiscretion. I was mad. Insane. You have compromised yourself seriously. I was only Crown Prince then, and I was young. I am but thirty now. It must be recovered. We have tried and failed. Your Majesty must pay. It must be bought. She will not sell. Stolen, then. Five attempts have been made. Twice burglars in my pay ransacked her house. Once we diverted her luggage when she travelled. Twice she has been waylaid. There has been no result. No sign of it. Absolutely none. Holmes laughed. It is quite a pretty little problem, said he. But a very serious one to me, returned the king reproachfully. Very indeed. And what does she propose to do with the photographs? To ruin me. But how? I am about to be married. So I have heard. To Clotilde Lofman von Saxe-Menenging, second daughter of the King of Scandinavia. You may know the strict principles of her family. She is herself a very soul of delicacy. A shadow of a doubt as to my conduct would bring the matter to an end. And Irene Adler threatens to send them the photograph. And she will do it. I know that she will do it. You do not know her, but she has a soul of steel. She has the face of the most beautiful of women, and the mind of the most resolute of men. There are no links to which she would not go. Are you sure that she has not sent it yet? I am sure. And why? Because she has said that she would send it on the day when the betrothal was publicly proclaimed. That will be next Monday. Oh, then we have three days yet, said Holmes with a yawn. That is very unfortunate, as I have one or two matters of importance to look into at the present. Your Majesty will, of course, stay in London for the present? Certainly. You will find me at the Langham under the name of Count von Scram. Then I shall drop you a line to let you know how we progress. Pray do so. I shall be all anxiety. Then as to money, you have carte blanche. Absolutely. I tell you that I would give one of the provinces of my kingdom to have that photograph. And for present expenses... The king took a heavy chamois leather bag from under his cloak and laid it on the table. There are three hundred pounds in gold and seven hundred in notes, he said. Holmes scribbled a receipt upon a sheet of his notebook and handed it to him. And mademoiselle's address, he asked. Is Briony Lodge, 
Serpentine Avenue, St. John's Wood. Holm took note of it. One other question, said he. Was the photograph a cabinet? It was. Then good night, your majesty, and I trust that we shall soon have some good news for you. And good night, Watson, he added as the wheels of the royal Burgum rolled down the street. If you will be good enough to call tomorrow afternoon at three o'clock, I should like to chat this little matter over with you. All right, that was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. That's it for me today and for episode 100. Thank you so much for being a part of the journey so far. I look forward to the next milestone, whatever that might be. I'll see you all Thursday for a new, regular episode. Bye bye